Greetings, Emmett here from readingforwisdom.com. The great British historian and soldier, Sir Michael Howard, has often spoken about the importance of being educated and read in breadth and depth. So he is always recommended to read widely and to read deeply. And this particularly applies to the study of warfare. Very, very important to uh, over a, a lifetime of, of interest in a subject like military history to read broadly and then to read about certain campaigns and battles and aspects of war in depth. Now one of the ways that we can read broadly on a subject is to use reference type works, works that aim to cover a broad range of ground, a broad range of history, but uh, allow also the development of sort of general themes um, about the subject. And in the study of warfare, what has been very common in these type of works is the study of battles, great battles, decisive battles, battles that have had an impact on world history. One of the earliest examples of such a book is Creasy's a uh, notable work from 1851, 15 Decisive Battles of the World. Um, it's a very well written text um, and uh, hugely popular all the way through the 19th century uh, and well into the 20th century. A lot of students learned a lot about these uh, battles through this book. Another notable example and a favourite uh, of mine and uh, something that uh, tutored many uh, historians of military history was Major General J.F.C. Boney Fuller's Decisive Battles of the Western World and Their Influence on History. So this was a three volume study by the great military thinker and advocate early, very early advocate and proponent of uh, tank warfare during the First World War. Um, and he's picked a whole range of battles here um, from the uh, early Greek, uh, ancient Greek period, right up to the then uh, modern day. And um, I personally have lots of volumes on battles uh, in my collection. Uh, a nice work like this. This is uh, not exactly a, a work of fantastic scholarship, but beautifully um, illustrated with um, lots of colour maps. And this is Great Battles, Decisive Conflicts That Have Shaped History, edited by Christer Jorgensen. Another really good read, the Mammoth Book of Battles. And this features writings from uh, folk like uh, John Keegan, John Pilmot, um, really good military historians. And this covers um, a whole range of battles in the modern era, um, 20th century mainly. Another recent example is uh, Peter Snow, the uh, BBC journalist, and his son Dan, the military historian, looking at 20th century battlefields. But our main book to focus on today is a work by a really, really top military historian, British historian Richard Overy. Now, Overy is um, famed for many things. Um, he's a great mili military and general historian, as I've said. He's particularly focused a lot on total war, on the Second World War. Uh, he's also editor of The Times Complete History of the World, which if you were to pick uh, one history volume and one history volume only, to study. I think that would be a very good choice. Uh, in my collection I've got a lot of stuff by Overy. Examples include The Burning Blue here where he contributes um, uh, a couple of essays. Um, he contributes to uh, one of my favourite books, uh, The Oxford History of uh, Modern War. Another good read in my collection by Overy is Why the Allies Won, which is uh, an interesting uh, perspective from him on the Second World War. But in the book we're studying today, uh, War, A History in a Hundred Battles, Overy has given us a really neat way to get that breadth of study. And what he has used is he has used the concept of battle to study a whole range of characteristics. Leadership against the odds, innovation, deception, courage in the face of fire and in the nick of time. 
And under those headings, he or those six headings, he looks at those hundred battles. So he picks up particular battles that um, give us a, a, a way of looking at those concepts like leadership. And in each individual reading, uh, Overy really gives us um, a very punchy, very concise um, way of uh, studying these concepts and really learning more about the military arts, military history. So what's the difference between battle and war? There is, of course, a distinction between wartime and battle. Wartime describes a state of conflict between two polities, whether tribes, city-states, nations or empires, which continues temporarily even when no fighting is going on, and which can be ended by negotiation or truce rather than battle. Many wars drag on for decades, punctuated by numerous battles, some more significant than others. The modern world wars did not last for decades, but their truly global scope in three dimensions produced hundreds of individual battles, from only a few of which it would be possible to predict the outcome of the entire conflict. Battles are certainly about achieving victory, however hollow it may prove, in defined space and defined time on land or sea. But they do not necessarily win wars. They have their own distinct historical character as particular events rather than as states of conflict. Simply put, battles involve large bodies of armed men whose principal purpose is to overwhelm the body of armed men opposed to them by killing them, capturing them, or forcing them to abandon the field. That's a pretty good definition. And Overy has a really nice format for uh, the book. So for each of the battles, what he effectively does is over four to five pages explores the battle, but in particular focuses on the aspect that he wants to study and how the battle um, really illustrates that aspect. So here's an example of Overy uh, musing on leadership using the Battle of Warsaw as an example. There are few more obvious examples of the importance of leadership in the history of modern war than the story of how Marshal Joseph Pilsudski's rout of the Red Army before the gates of Warsaw in the summer of 1920. What made the battle all the more extraordinary was the curious blend of old and new. There were pitched engagements between cavalry units with lance and sabre. The progress of the Red Cavalry was marked by a level of violence towards the troops and populations in its path that they resembled the Thirty Years' War of the 17th century. But there were primitive tanks, armoured trains and a handful of aircraft to show that this was also a conflict of the 20th. Overy then goes on to uh, explore the battle talk through the various different personalities and steps, the tactics, the strategy, before he concludes. The battle for Warsaw depended for its outcome entirely on the success of Pilsudski's operational inspiration and bold leadership. An ability to act opportunistically, even in the face of uncertain risks, had strong echoes of Napoleon at his best. Victory did not depend on the modern armoury of aircraft, tanks and radio, but relied a great deal on the simplicity and speed of the Polish counter-strike and on the patriotic fervour of the embattled Polish divisions. This meant literally a matter of life and death for them and for the new national Poland. Nineteen years later, when it was the German turn to attack, the armoury of Blitzkrieg condemned the Poles to the rapid loss of Warsaw and showed what a modern war of manoeuvre could achieve. Pilsudski became Poland's hero and died in 1935, four years before the new war. Tukhachevsky was eventually arrested and executed on Stalin's orders in June 1937, a long revenge for the failure at Warsaw. War, a history in a hundred battles, certainly is a really good book for achieving that breadth of reading on warfare. It covers a heck of a lot of ground from ancient battles right up to the modern day and beautifully written, beautifully researched by Overy. He's a top professor and an acclaimed writer for a reason. If you like the type of books that we're reviewing here on Reading for Wisdom, please do give us a like, 
subscribe to our channel and come over to readingforwisdom.com for more material, more things of interest. See you soon. Thank you.